So on a sunny morning in January of 2014, I uh, was sitting in the dining room of my home in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and near me on the floor of the dining room was my five-year-old daughter, Rebecca, uh, playing. And there was something about that moment when I looked over at her, the way the sun was coming in through the front windows of the dining room and falling on her, reminded me actually almost forcefully of a picture I had taken her just over five years previously, which was this one. And I wanted to capture that echo, so I went and I got my camera, and I asked her if I could take her picture, and for once, she agreed. Uh, she, didn't, uh, she didn't throw up her hand to block my shot, as was her, one of her favorite things to do. She didn't really even mug for the camera. Uh, she just let me take the pictures of which this was one. But what I didn't know, as I put away my camera after taking this picture, was that all of our worst fears had already come true, and Rebecca's cancer had returned. I would not know for a few weeks, but right around the time I took this picture, a tumor began to grow from the lining of the ventricle behind one of her eyes. And a little less than five months later, in the early evening, on her sixth birthday, it killed her. Some of you already knew how that story ended, and for the rest of you, I am sorry to drop that on you. But I tell you that so that you understand the context for what I am going to tell you next. About six months later, uh, about six months after Rebecca's funeral, pardon me, on Christmas Eve day, I was in my office wrapping things up before the holiday started. And uh, for whatever reason, I went to Facebook. And when my timeline loaded, this is what I was presented with. Here's what your year looked like. And I want you to stop for a moment and ask yourself, as David Byrne might have, how did we get here? What process led to me being given without my consent or any obvious way to make it stop this little clip art party that appeared to be celebrating the death of my little girl? I want you to work your way backwards, reverse engineer this and try to envision, as I did once the shock had worn off, what decisions and what assumptions led to this honestly horrifying moment. And some of you may already be there. Maybe you've been parts of those conversations, those sorts of conversations. You can imagine how that happened. But if you're still struggling with this just a little bit, then the fastest way I can think of to get there is to ask yourself a simple question. Who was this for? Who was that designed moment for? Who were they designing for when they created Year in Review and the call to action that was placed into a timeline trying to get me to actually use Year in Review, a product that I had, probably understandably, been avoiding? And I think this is the answer. This is who Year in Review was designed for. People have, who had a great year and want to share it, right? People who want to look back through their compendium of, compendium of photos of their selfies with their friends and the view from the mountain that they hiked up that summer and um, you know memories of the trips that they took or the the parties that they went to whatever that was for people like that year in review was perfectly designed it was possibly the best design one of the best designs i can think of to address that core vision but that product year in review and it's call to action didn't take any other use case into account. Didn't even think about it, so far as I can tell. They started from that core concept of people who had a great year and want to share it, and they never looked beyond it. And we can roll our eyes and shake our heads and think to ourselves, you know, well, how could they have been so blind? But the truth is, we have all done this. In one form or another, we have all had this sort of tunnel vision and almost certainly had it in the process of doing our work. Because it is, the, it is the easiest, it's the most human thing to do, to focus on that idealized vision, on that, on that idealized outcome, and become so focused on it, and, and do everything we can to reach that state that we develop those, the, that tunnel vision, those blinders, and forget how complex and messy and nuanced and weird actual life can really be. 
Let me illustrate for a moment what I mean. I would like you to imagine a user, not uh, for what you're doing, not for what you're designing for, but for a completely different kind of uh, site or product altogether. I would like you, for example, to imagine the user of an apartment hunting website, unless you work on an apartment hunting website, in which case, I would like you to envision uh, the user of a website for a fitness center. Okay, you have your user in mind, either apartment hunting or fitness center, really your choice. Now I have some questions. What gender did you, of, of person did you envision? How about their ethnicity, their age? What do they want from your site? What, what, what is it that they're, that they're doing there? Why, why did they come to this site to, to, uh, at all? And how do they feel? What's their context, right? Not just how do they feel about using your work, but how do they feel in general? How do they feel before they even got there? And the most critical question here is what if you're wrong? What if the actual user who comes to the site is nothing like that you know, the idealized user that you envisioned? What if they're different in every way? Would your design decisions still serve them or would you let them down? Would you make their lives actually more difficult? And it's easy to be wrong because our instinct is to imagine someone who looks a lot like ourselves, right? Or someone who looks like our stereotyped idea of what um, the user of a product might be. So for the apartment hunting website, you might have envisioned a young 20-something recently out of college who's looking for their first apartment. Or potentially you might have envisioned uh, someone who's recently retired, they've, they're downsizing, they've sold their house and they're, or they're about to sell their house and they're looking for a place to stay once they're done uh, being a homeowner. And in fact, the, user, the actual users of an apartment hunting website might be both of those cases and a whole lot of others besides because the world is wide and the web covers it all. So many of our users are nothing like us or our stereotyped visions in any way. And I say stereotype not as a, as a means of dismissal, but as a, as, a, as a label for what it is that we, the sorts of thinking that we all do, right? That tendency to envision a stereotype is also very human. In his uh, book, Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, economist Daniel Kahneman uh, discusses system one versus system two thinking. Uh, those of you who have read it, I'm sure you remember that. It was basically the entire first quarter of the book. Uh, you may have come across these concepts with other labels, but system one and system two is what I came across. If you're not familiar with this terminology or, or, this, or this model, uh, the easiest analogy here is the tortoise and the hare. So system one thinking is the hare. It's quick, it's automatic, it takes very low effort and therefore consumes very little mental energy. Yeah. So we tend to default to it. Like most of us, our brains are inherently lazy. They seek to expend as little effort as possible to do what, uh, what needs to be done. System two thinking, by contrast, is more like the tortoise. It's slow, it's methodical, right? It's, it's the sort of thinking you do when you're doing like close analysis uh, or, or reasoning, uh, trying to do memorization of difficult uh, to retain facts is system two, right? All of that takes energy, again, which our brains want to conserve. So we tend to avoid the system two and go to the system one when at all possible, okay? So as an example, if you know a lot of people who have impaired vision or even really any people who have impaired vision, you are more likely to envision someone who has difficulty seeing, right? Or with the, uh, the fitness center website uh, example, um, if your experience of a fitness center is a lot of, you know, again, a lot of young 20-somethings who are staying fit, then that is the sort of user that you would tend to experience. But if your fitness center experiences more active seniors, then that's the sort of user that you might first envision when thinking about who's gonna be using this, this fitness center website or, or product for that matter. System one thinking isn't wrong, it's not bad, it's completely human, but it's a little bit dangerous. It, le it can lead us astray very easily in our work because it, it because it doesn't take that energy and we tend to take that path of least mental re resistance, we don't always hit that system two thinking that we should be, uh, should be hitting. And the good thing about this is that uh, system two processes with enough practice become system one processes. 
uh, a good example of that being driving. If you remember when you started out driving, nothing about it is instinctual, basically. Um, operating a half-ton piece of machinery at, at highway or even surface speeds, at first, it takes an incredible amount of concentration and analysis and second guessing, and am I doing this right, and what's going on here, right? But over time, as you get more practice driving, it gradually becomes system one thinking, to the point that if you've been driving long enough, uh, lots of people tend to, you know, basically it becomes so ingrained and so automatic that they're basically doing it without thinking about it at all, to the point that uh, people tend start to assume that they can do things like drive and text at the same time. Like they're wrong, but that's where we tend to go. And if you've ever noticed, when you're around a system two driver, like a, a, a student driver, you tend to get kicked out of system one because you have no idea what they're gonna do, right? Everyone around you that you're, the, that you're used to doing system one driving effectively, instinctual driving, you get a feel for how it works. I mean, it's different in different regions. I understand that Florida drivers have their own very unique way of conducting their business, right? But if you've been a Florida driver for any period of time, you quickly absorb what those instincts are. You develop instincts that are sort of relative to where you are, as opposed to if you live in the Midwest or the Great Lakes or whatever, someplace like Cleveland, where people actually alternate merge and do so with a wave, not a finger, right? that becomes instinctual. But when you're around a student driver, like, I don't know what they're gonna do. Because they don't know what they're gonna do. Right? And you know that, and you're trying to get away from them as quickly as possible so you can get back to the system one thinking and stop spending all of your time trying worrying about what someone else is gonna do in their car. Just imagine what life is like for driving instructors. Right? But the idea, the point I'm making here is that if you take your time with that sort of close analysis of what you're assuming, that system two thinking over time, it becomes more instinctual. It becomes second nature, as we often say. So you might, for a while, have to think really carefully about what am I assuming about uh, the users of this product and what, where might I be wrong about that. But then over time, you become more, more uh, facile with it or more, more accustomed to asking yourself what it could mean to be completely and totally wrong in your assumptions. And when it comes to this sort of thing, we're all really still student drivers, or actually uh, worse than student drivers in a lot of ways, because at least student drivers uh, tend to assume that anything they do wrong will instantly lead to fiery automotive death, which is why they're super cautious. Right? We're more like student drivers who have played Mario Kart, and so we think we're Mario Andretti. Right? We don't know enough to be cautious. We don't know enough to plan for the worst. So um, in keeping with this automotive theme, we're actually not like student drivers. We're more like automobile designers about 50 years ago. So you may have seen this video recently. Uh, it's been making the rounds again. Back in 2009, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety celebrated their 50th anniversary by doing a moderate overlap test, what we used to call a frontal offset crash test, right, where they took a 1959 Chevrolet Bel Air and a 2009 Chevy Malibu and smacked them into each other because auto insurers really know how to party. <laughs> so you got this big honking Bel Air, right, basically built from re-welded tank steel and chrome and incredibly heavy duty and they smacked it into, you know, one of these new fiberglass and tin foil cars, right? So, of course the Bel Air did better, right? Yeah, you know how this ends. But let's go to the tape. I'd like you to keep your eye on the interior cabin uh, video for the Bel Air. Yeah, no. And then look into the cabin of that Malibu, the 2009 Malibu. That is 50 years of automotive engineering more to the point, 50 years of seeing what can go wrong and coming up with ways to mitigate seat belts, airbags, kinetic crumple zones, safety glass, right? All that stuff because the auto industry, however reluctantly at times, took a look at what could go wrong and they learned from it. Now, as we saw yesterday in the film, in places, we still have some, they still have some ways to go, but 
they have shown the capacity to learn. Uh, over the years, they've learned to plan for the worst, right? You and I don't get into a car to drive somewhere and ask ourselves, what happens if somebody runs a red light and T-bones me? How could I, like, what are all the ways I could die on my way to the grocery store? I mean, if you do think that way, typically they prescribe medication to help you get through the day, right? And I don't know, maybe in Florida you do think those things I'm, about where I come from. Um, we don't, but we don't have to ask ourselves those questions precisely because all those automotive engineers did ask themselves those questions. They asked themselves, as Jeremy was talking about this morning, what are the ways that things could go horribly wrong and how can we do our best to, make the, to, to keep the occupants of our product alive, right? So they were, all the time that they're working on things like making the car look cool and making it you know, fun to drive and giving it good fuel economy and all of those things, they're also asking themselves, what do we do when things go horribly wrong? But web designers and developers, this is us. We're tootling along in our shiny new Bel Air figuring, hey, what could go wrong? And then when something does go wrong, our reaction tends to be, well, let's hope that never happens again. And as I say, it's not just design, it's development as well. To see what I mean, I'm gonna jump, jump back to 2001. Remember zip drives, jazz drives, iOmega? Yeah, that satisfying chunk they make? Well, iOmega had a banner ad that they ran on various news sites, and as a result, this happened. Now, that was 2001, the primitive days of the internet, when they just didn't know any better. Well, in 2007, guess what happened to Sony? Okay, that's 2007, but surely the lesson was learned, right? Last year, on an article about attitudes towards the death penalty, we got this ad. Now, it's been argued that this is somewhat inevitable. If you take a whole bunch of content and a whole bunch of ads and you smush them together. The problem here is that there's no, basically there's no uh, attempt here to try to avoid the problem in the first place. Right? I have actually talked to people who work on ad networks and I've said, do you have like keyword exclusion? And they said, no, we don't. We don't try to keep certain ads away from certain topics. Right? Because those systems are not designed for people. They are designed for consumers. That is the point of the ad network. They're not trying to talk to people. And that is a problem. Unfortunately, it gets worse. So, if you're uh, familiar with laughingsquid.com, Scott Beal, the proprietor uh, there, went to Poland uh, a few years ago and he took this picture at Dachau, uh, the, one of the gates there, with this, uh, this German slogan that the, it translates to, work makes you free. The Nazis were really big on putting this all over their extermination camps. Okay. So Scott uploaded this picture to Flickr, as one does, and three years later, Flickr introduced a new, uh, new bit of code to their service called auto-tagging, where they used advanced image processing to try to, you know, look at the, Im basically analyze the image and figure out what sorts of tags that the user hadn't already added to the image might go well with the image. So in this one, the Flickr code added some uh, tags that made sense, like building and chain link, but it also added sport and jungle gym, which is breathtakingly awful in context. So that happened last year in 2015. You can probably imagine, given how many photos Flickr has, uh, that that was not the only example of code that went awry. Another uh, happened with a picture of a man named William, which was taken as part of a series of photos of people living in Los Angeles. This photo was also auto-tagged, in this case almost a year after it had been posted. Flickr's neural network decided to add the tag animal. And you might, again, say to yourself, well, at least that served as a cautionary tale so that other people would not be so blind as to do that. Two months later, Google also introduced auto-tagging to their photo service, and the same thing happened. I have to admit, every time I give this talk, I get a little more furious. We should not be this stupid. This is us as an industry. 
We're designing and developing without sufficiently thinking through the possible ramifications of what it is we're doing. These are all examples, these, all these examples I just showed are situations where the people responsible did not stop to ask themselves, how could this go horribly wrong and what can we do to prevent or at least mitigate that? Right. In the case of Flickr and Google and their auto tagging, they could have asked themselves, what are we assuming? What are we missing? What are the failure modes? What is the absolute worst outcome we can possibly imagine? And now that we've imagined it, what is an outcome that's worse than that? Right. What are we, you know, how, what are we missing in the way that we're even building this system? How can we work to avoid or mitigate any of these negative outcomes? Right? Because, I mean, someone having their friends tagged as gorillas is horrible enough. But imagine somebody whose photos were auto-tagged that way and they had no idea that it had happened. Right? I can show you the screenshots because the people who were affected by that code noticed. But remember, that code was run against every photo in those services and there was no notification of, hey, we added these tags to this photo. And now, imagine a situation where that's the case, that automatically added tag hangs around for a few years, and then somewhere down the line, some completely other person comes into that, comes in to, you know, to that photo, sees the tag, doesn't understand where it came from, thinks that the person who actually took the photo added the tag, and goes on a rampage, an internet rampage. I mean, how would you like to have an internet hate mob land on your head because a neural network in Silicon Valley did something that no decent human would ever consider doing? Or how would you like to be responsible for having built the neural network that landed a whole bunch of internet hate mobs on the heads of completely innocent users of your product? I don't expect for a moment, nor am I arguing, that Flickr and Google should have abandoned their auto-tagging completely. That sort of thing is going to happen, right? Whether or not it's exactly auto-tagging photos or you know, facial detection, whatever it is, these things are gonna happen. What's important is that we, as designers, as developers, as both, think a lot harder about what we're doing and how it can go awry. We need to plan for the worst. Which, as Jeremy was talking about that, and I grant you it can sound a little melodramatic, and it, I mean, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. Planning for the worst is actually sometimes a very nuanced approach. To uh, illustrate this, I'd like to share an example that um, Sarah Walker Betcher and I put into the book that Jeremy mentioned that, that we published about all of this called Design for Real Life. So this is the mission statement for a big box home improvement store that shall remain anonymous. I will refer to them as Lowe's Depot, <laughs> right? But if you read this mission statement, it's a pretty good mission statement. I read through this thing and I, I kind of feel, you know, sitting in, my, sitting in my office, I look at it and I think to myself, man, I'm kind of sick of typing. Someone give me a saw, I want to go build something, right? But the team at Lowe's Depot realized that when they were taking that mission statement and, and working off of it, they basically only had a single kind of user in mind, which is these lovely folks, right? People who have a home improvement project of some sort, they would need to repaint the dining room or uh, they want to um, build a woodshed out back or whatever it is, right? They have this thing that they've been thinking about uh, doing and they're about to do it and wow, are they happy to be doing it. Right? That was the use case that they had in mind. What they realized they weren't really thinking about was someone who's more in this kind of situation, right? where the fridge has suddenly died, or an upstairs water pipe cracked and ruined a bunch of drywall and plaster below it, um, or uh, the kitchen sink basin suddenly and very loudly separated from the countertop it was affixed to, and a bunch of water went everywhere and things are ruined, and, right? And this has to be dealt with right now regardless of how much room is left on the credit card. So what they realized at Lowe's Depot was that all of their online guides as to how to do things or how to figure out how to do a job uh, were all really peppy and upbeat. And it's like, all right, you're finally ready to install that cute new brick patio out back. Woo, all right. You know, literally their guide on refrigerators, the first section 
explained what a refrigerator does and what a freezer did, okay, um, in a very cheerful, upbeat, peppy way. <laughs> but still, you know, that's all great if you're actually doing the cute patio or you're replacing the refrigerator that you've been looking forward to replacing for a while. But it's kind of in the way and even a little bit alienating if you're dealing with a situation more like this. It's like, I do not need you to make me feel all excited about the fact that I'm about to replace the refrigerator that broke and spoiled all most of our food. I just need to know what I'm looking for in a refrigerator, right? Because this refrigerator was 20 years old and I have no idea what refrigerators are like now. I know what they do, thank you very much, but I need like, do I need to upgrade my electrical? Is there, you know, is it possible to get a fridge without a water feeder line if I don't have a water feeder line, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look at this mission statement again, but with all of that in mind, even without changing a single word of this, we can already, you know, we can see that we can design more for those sort of stressful situations. So uh, this is what they came up with. The first three points, pretty universal to anything we might do, right? Pri prioritize things that are helpful, at a glance help, plain language, but there was that last one that they adopted that, that maybe we don't usually do, which is write for the urgent case, right? Don't try to sell people on the fact that they need a new refrigerator. If they're looking at your how-to guide, they already probably need, know that they're getting a new refrigerator, just very neutrally, like help them out. If you've never thought in these terms, that's okay, right? Very few of us do or have, but it's something we can train ourselves to do, right? By planning for the worst, we can actually be at our best. And I can think of no better illustration of this than the Florida Hospital Orlando website here. I would like you to look at this and tell me, if you need, if you get a call that a loved one has been taken to the hospital in an ambulance and you need to get there as quickly as possible to be at their side, where do you go to find out what to do? There's nothing. You can keep looking. There's really nothing. Even in the drop downs, you might think to yourself, well, it's hidden in a drop down. No, I have opened the drop downs. There's really nothing there. Or at least there wasn't at the time I took this, at this, uh, I took this screenshot. And I would be willing to bet that there isn't anything there because I'm being a little bit unfair to the Florida hospital uh, here. I have looked at dozens of hospital websites of which this is a sample and not one of them has anything like an obvious path to help people in the situation I described. Right? These are institutions that have major departments with the word urgent in the department title, and they haven't asked themselves, how, do, how can we meet urgent cases? Right? If there's an emergency, which happens in hospitals, how can we help people who are trying to deal with that situation? What's the worst case scenario? What does that mean in our context? And how can we help? And a lot of times, especially if you're not working for a hospital, you think to yourself, well, you know, we're designing for the 90%, not the 10%, right? These are edge cases, but as Evan Hensley uh, pointed out, the term edge case is really telling, and I think it's damaging, honestly. When we say edge case, we are explicitly marginalizing certain situations. We are saying that those are things that we don't have to care about as much because, right, we're, we're designing for the majority. And that's why, as I say, I think the term edge case is, is actually damaging. It holds us back. It, it, it channels our thoughts in certain directions. And so in, in the book, Sarah and I actually advocate for a term that we learned from Jared Spool, which is stress case. Don't think of edge cases. Think of stress cases. And a good way to identify uh, stress cases and, and think them through is to identify your assumptions. Right? Figure out what it is you're taking for granted. Apple probably should have done this when they launched HealthKit, which is a suite of software and APIs that uh, allows things like the, uh, your Apple Watch to measure your heart rate and communicate that information back to your iPhone, your, your desktop machine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They went way further than, than just the Apple Watch. They created this whole API so uh, Nike Fuel and uh, you know, any number of devices could communicate that information to the computer. Uh, sleep cycle tracking, nutrition, calories, all, you know, a zillion other things. But I use this picture of the, from the announcement, the literal announcement uh, of the keynote where um, they have this picture of this smiling, healthy woman as the user avatar uh, because it really highlights the irony of what Apple failed to do, 
which was to provide a way for women to track their menstrual cycle. Now, they did fix this in the next major update of HealthKit a year later, but it seems pretty clear to me that they didn't question some of their assumptions about this project, which might not even be as obvious an assumption as what kinds of users are we envisioning and what other kinds of users might there be, but it could have been as subtle as what kinds of health metrics are we not thinking about because they seem scary or gross or taboo to us for whatever reason, which might have led them to actually think about menstrual cycles, which are relevant to about half of the population. But they might have also thought about things like sexual activity or bodily waste, which do, uh, which are components of physical health. But back to menstrual cycles. I want to flip it around and look at an app that's specifically designed for that. This is Glow. Uh, this is a way for uh, women to track their menstrual cycle, right? And it's great if you're tracking your period for the purpose of, purposes of knowing when you are or are not fertile. Uh, but for other women, it was not really as it claimed your best friend through the multiple phases of your life. Because there's nothing here for women who want to track their cycle for non-fertility related reasons, right? In some ways, this is actually kind of off-putting to women who are in that situation, right? Choose your journey. I'm not on a journey. I just want to know when my next period starts, right? And there are a couple of ways that the designers at GLOW could have avoided this. The first would be to, per to conduct a project pre-mortem, which sounds a little weird in a health context, but go with me here. Right? You may be familiar with project postmortems. probably a lot of you do them, where when the project is done, you go back through and you say to yourself, okay, what went wrong, what, what could have been better? Or if it was a smashing success, it's, hey, what went right so we can do that again in the future? But that's what a postmortem is. A pre-mortem, by contrast, is an exercise that's undertaken as a project is getting started. You might even do it before the project has really kicked off in order to determine the shape of the project, or for that matter, if the project should happen at all. So in Glow's case, one premortem that they could have done would be, to, would be to say to themselves something like this, get everyone together in a room and say, okay, the new design has been launched for six months and our sign-up abandonment rate has been rising the entire time, why? And everyone in the room tries to think up reasons why the sign-up abandonment rate might go up over time after the new design is launched, right? So it, that might lead you to things like, uh, unclear copy, or maybe the, the contrast is, isn't good enough. But they might also have come to the realization that their sign-up process was already turning away an entire set of women just from the assumptions it was making. And given the name GLOW, maybe their whole focus is we only want to provide menstrual tracking for women who are dealing with fertility or you know, either trying to get pregnant or not trying to get pregnant. But that still, that pre-mortem would still lead them to say, okay, are we not communicating that during our onboarding? Or, maybe more crucially, are we not communicating that in our marketing so that we have women who are downloading the app because they think it's just for menstrual tracking, they realize that that's not actually, it's not for all menstrual tracking, and then they abandon the sign-up process because they realize it's not for them. Maybe the marketing needs to be better. Maybe it doesn't really have anything to do with the actual visual design or user experience. But marketing is designed too. Another way to find and grapple with assumptions is what Sarah and I call in the book the designated dissenter. I know some of you already want to update your business cards to say that as a title, and I get it, but the role of the designated dissenter is to ask themselves things like the kinds of questions I've been putting forth here and more. At every stage of the project, their role is to identify the assumptions that are being made and ask themselves, what if this assumption is wrong? Right? How can what we're doing here boomerang on us or our users? So uh, think back to year in review, right? And the, that assumption of people who had a great year and want to share it. A designated dissenter on that project might have said, okay, what we're assuming is people who had a great year and want to share it. What about people who had a horrible year and don't want to share it? Or what about people who had a horrible year but actually do want to share it? Because sometimes that can be very cathartic. Or people who had a great year but have no interest whatsoever in sharing it. Are the design, the copy, the, the call to action, things that we're doing here how might they either help people in those various situations or possibly lose some user trust, right? Because, hey, I had a great year, but I have no interest in sharing it. Stop pushing it at me, 
or in my case, I had a horrible year, I really don't want to relive it, thank you very much. And then later on, you know, throughout the whole process, just keep asking themselves. And it can get down to the very, you know, very smallest uh, pieces. Like this piece of copy, is it making assumptions? Uh, and is it making assumptions that could, that could blow up in our faces, basically, and in our users' faces? So this is a role that someone on, on the project should take, but it's critical that different people get to, a chance to take this role. So for a given project, one person should have this role, or if you have a sufficiently large team, maybe two people. Um, but then on the next project, different people need to take on that role. There's a couple of reasons for this. One is that if somebody is always the designated dissenter, then everyone else learns to tune them out, right? The buzzkill over there in the corner who's always raining on our parade, right? But more importantly, I think, it gives everyone a chance to do that system two process and get practice so that it becomes a system one process. It begins to become more instinctual. So eventually everyone on the team kind of has this as a second nature. Because we may not have been formally trained to do any of this, but we can train ourselves. So another of the areas where we, I think we can do the most good the fastest is by being clear about what it is we intend to do with really everything, right? And it's really easy to fall prey to misleading assumptions uh, and inadvertently create uncomfortable or even damaging scenarios. Um, an example of this can be found on Twitter. Everyone know hash flags? that Twitter does where they put a little icon thing, uh, some sort of little graphic next to the hashtags. It started out with, I believe, the World Cup. So they would put little national flags if you put, you know, uh, Octothorpe G-E-R for Germany, it would put a little German flag next to it. So they're called hash flags. Um, they add a little bit of visual punch to the tweet without uh, adding to the character count. Uh, but it also happens without asking or even warning the user that it will happen. So every year uh, on the 4th of May, I, uh, I tweet the opening lines to Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young's Ohio, uh, which is my way of remembering the nine students who were wounded and the four who were killed when National Guardsmen opened fire on a crowd of students in, at Kent State University in Northeast Ohio. This is an event that still has resonance uh, where I live. I know people who were on campus that day um, or who had friends who were on campus that day. And it still, it still has a lot of resonance where I live. But anyway, last year, 2015, I did this, and I tagged it, hashtagged it May the 4th, and imagine my surprise when Twitter added a Stormtrooper helmet. Because May the 4th be with you. So this immediately creates two problems. One, it makes it look like I'm trying to make pop culture light of an event that is, as I say, still deeply felt where, where I live, even half a century later. The second is the historical context of the term stormtrooper actually creates a level of political commentary here that I did not myself intend. Twitter, by changing my content, changed in a lot of ways the meaning of what it was I said. And that might not seem too serious, but it turns out that May the 4th is also a day of observance in the Netherlands. It's called Remembrance of the Dead, and it is specifically about honoring people who died in military and peacekeeping operations since the beginning of World War II. They have a moment of silence nationwide uh, as part of this. So imagine a stormtrooper helmet being applied to a tweet commemorating the Dutch resistance fighters who died fighting the Nazis in World War II. Twitter could avoid this by actually showing you the hash flag as you're composing the tweet or putting up a little, war a little uh, dialogue before the tweet goes out that says, hey, we're gonna do this, is that okay? Um, maybe giving people an on-off, right? No, please do not hash flag my tweet or my tweets in general, right? Because imagine someone just tweeting and not realizing that this has happened and then all of a sudden they're getting a lot of angry replies. Um, and this is something that Twitter could avoid, but they haven't either haven't thought this through or haven't felt that it's worth warning people that they're about to change their content. By contrast, Facebook actually has a pretty good example of signaling intent. So when, you, uh, when you're signing up and you're setting your, your gender identification, you have now three choices. It used to be two, now there are three. The third is custom. If you pick custom, then they give you a text box where you can uh, really type whatever you want, the same as you would uh, if, you, if you were providing your uh, political or religious affiliation. I, for example, for my political affiliation have eclectic, because that's how I feel. 
Right? So, but you don't have to pick from a limited list. Uh, but when you start typing, they give you this drop-down type ahead kind of thing that pre-fills with things other people have, uh, have provided. So you might see one of those and say, oh yeah, that, that's me, click. Or yeah, none of those are me, I'm gonna keep typing. All right, that's all fine. But where they really get the signaling intent right is down underneath that input. So if you notice in the upper right, there's, uh, for your gender identification, you can set your privacy. You can say, the whole world can see it, or only my friends and family, or only my friends, or only me. Well, I mean, only you and Facebook. But, um, but for the preferred pronoun, they tell you, this is public, right? If you set this to male, then when it pops up on other people's timelines, hey, it's so-and-so's birthday, wish him a happy birthday. And your choices are him, her, and them, effectively, right? But they're letting you know and giving you a chance to learn more that, hey, when you set this, anyone else can see it regardless of what you've done up there at the top. It's not necessarily perfect. I'm not claiming that this is the ideal solution here, but it is, uh, I think, a well-done solution. Um, and a really fantastic example of this principle uh, can be seen on patients like me. Uh, patients like me, as it might sound like, is a social network where people who have medical conditions can meet and talk to other people with those same conditions. So you, if you've been diagnosed with lupus, you can go into the lupus sort of bulletin board area and uh, talk to people. If there's one site that Sarah and I looked up to uh, a lot you know, in writing the book, it was this one. They're doing so many things right. Um, and to pick one example of many, I, I, seriously, I could build an hour-long talk just around what patients like me is doing. Uh, they asked for both gender and sex assigned at birth. But they, this is literally in the sign-up, they explained why they asked for both. Right? Because sex assigned at birth is a data point that's used in medical studies. Gender identification, at least to this point, is not. But rather than just say, give us this data to sign up, they explain why they're asking for it. Right? They explain... They explain what they'll do with it, in effect. Remember, people who come to the site are most likely coming there because they've just been diagnosed with something and they'd really like to connect with other people who have the same condition to tell them things like, what should I be asking my doctor right now? Or what should I expect in six months? All those kinds of things. Patients like me could have completely held that to ransom. They could have said, you want access to the communities? Give us this information. But they don't. They made the choice to be kind. They made that choice to show compassion to people who were coming to use their service. So uh, I'd like you to uh, also think about things like considering the context. A good example of this is Bank Simple. Uh, well, Simple now. Um, used to be called Bank Simple, a new banking startup, because everything's a startup now. They've got this really slick design aesthetic that goes, and then when you go down, it, you know, once a day you get a comment about how cool my Simple card is. Wow, that's Sounds so cool. And then later on, the absolute euphoric sense you get from using simple as your banking service. Man, euphoria from a bank, it's going to be illegal within months. Right? Even they have this obsessively beautifully designed unboxing experience when you get your card, right? It's a good day. You know, excited? We're a bit giddy. Woo <laughs> but if you lose your exciting and euphoria inducing simple card, they drop the brand. This is the screen they show you when you go to block your card. There's no soothing, you know, soothing blocks of copy. The design's not as slick as Johnny Ive scalp, right? It is just neutral and to the point. And the copy starts with exactly what it needs to. This is a reversible process. That is all you need to know at the, in this moment, right? If it turns out later that I just misplaced my card and it wasn't stolen, then I can unblock it. That's fine. And if it turns out that it was stolen, then I've already blocked it. My money is protected. Right, but in the meantime, I don't have to worry about, oh, if it turns out that it wasn't stolen and I find that I misplaced it, then like, do I have to wait for them to ship me a whole new card and I don't have access to my money for two or three days or however long it's gonna take, right? All those worries are gone. This is a moment where Simple had the self-confidence to not be consciously self-confident, if you see what I'm saying there. They were willing to drop their branding in order to meet the user where they are. Another firm that does this really well is MailChimp. Brad talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, in the show, right, and how their tone has changed. They're not the eep, eep, have fun monkey all the time anymore. And on their site, Voice and Tone, uh, this really plays out. This is a, they have this uh, opening text. And this is the site that all new hires at MailChimp are, are basically sat down in front of and told, read this, so that you understand 
like what, what it is we do and, and the difference between voice and tone. It says our voice doesn't change much, but our tone adapts, right? So uh, I absolutely encourage you to go to voiceandtone.com. If you haven't before, explore it because you know, each of these pages says things like, okay, for a success message, the user's likely feelings, relief, pride, anticipation, that sort of thing, right? And here are some tips, like feel free to be funny, right? Um, but if they're in the knowledge base, right, that's a moment to be neutral because they might be in the knowledge base because they're, you know, wow, MailChimp's so cool, I wanna learn more about how to use it. Or they could be in the knowledge base because, God, MailChimp isn't working, I tried to do a thing and it's broken and how do I fix it, right? So they're, basically they're saying interest and curiosity but they're not assuming either like interest or frustration. But then when it comes to some sort of failure, right, users likely feelings, confusion, stress, anger, right? And it says things like offer a solution, be straightforward, be serious, don't joke around with people who are frustrated. Because when you toss out jokes in that kind of situation, it can come off as mocking or, or dismissive. Right? And just because somebody got a failure message, it doesn't mean that they, as Brad said, just spam 10,000 people. Could be that they just messed something up. And Kay Kiefer Lee really summed it up, I think, when she said, you know, we don't know what our readers and customers are going through, but they're, they're people, right? It's easy to think of them as users, but thinking of them, thinking of them as real people goes a long way towards keeping and maintaining that sense of compassion. Kate actually also provides another uh, interesting uh, tip. This is one that, that Sarah and I really liked. Uh, her editing tip, uh, basically her tip for content is read it aloud. Just take your copy and read it aloud and see if it sounds anything like what an actual human would say. Sarah and I uh, sort of j uh, made this into the what would a human do test, which ties back to uh, Crystal in her talk this morning when she, when she uh, said, turn to the person next to you and pretend you are your site and what is the first question you ask. It's anthropomorphizing your design decisions and the user interactions and asking yourself, okay, what, what is actually happening here, right? So, uh, you know, if, you're, if you have a, uh, if you ask people for their name and you have some sort of real names policy like Facebook does, um, if the name for whatever reason trips a flag, you might not wanna say that name is invalid and unacceptable. Like imagine what that would be like in person. Hey, what's your name? Oh, I'm Joe. I'm sorry, Joe's not an acceptable name. I will give you a minute to come up with a better one. Right, you probably get punched. Um, but again, what would a human do? How would, a, how would one person interact with another in this situation? Because that's what, really what we're doing. We're, we're dealing with people, real people and all their complexity. And we, unlike the designers in so many other fields, we have the opportunity to meet them where they are, instead of demanding that they come to meet us where we are comfortable. Because almost uniquely, everything we design, we design for millions, if we're lucky, but every one of those interactions is personal. I'm gonna return to patients like me for a perfect example of valuing people instead of users. Uh, as I said, when you sign up for patients like me, they have you know all these fields, but very few of them are required, right? And Patients like me, and they're very upfront about this when you sign up, uh, most of their revenue comes from licensing access to their data sets to partners, to medical researchers, to pharmaceutical companies, where they can say, hey, uh, we're seeing that all, you know, half of the people in our lupus group are reporting this weird adverse reaction to a new, um, new medication. And then the pharmaceutical company will say, we would like to have access to your data so we can look at that and try to figure out what's going on, okay? But for the most part, they let users leave their, their inputs blank. They don't force people to lie to get through the form, right? Because as, as our design director said, and, and we heard earlier today, people get really frustrated when they feel like they have to lie, right? Patients like me is putting their institutional survival at some degree of risk. If the data is incomplete enough, if enough people don't provide uh, enough data during sign-up, their partners will not want to pay for access to the data. It won't be useful to them. Patients like me is taking that risk to let people have access to what it is that they're offering, which is really courageous. It shouldn't be. I mean, that should be the norm, but it isn't. And a tool that can be used in these sorts of situations, uh, and for that matter, uh, in a lot more, 
is to use the question protocol from the book Forms That Work. Um, this is basically the question protocol. It's used to, you can use it to assess basically everything you ask on your form, every field. Um, because, and it's useful because it helps make decisions intentional. It forces everyone involved to ask, what is the intent, right? What are, why are we making users take this step, right? It, which is really easy to sort of compartmentalize in a form, right? Like, why are we asking them if they want to be Mr., Ms., Miss, Doctor, you know, Mrs., et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Why are we asking that at all? Does it matter? Do we ever use that? Who will make use of that? Who in the organization cares, right? Are we asking because we need it? Or are we asking because it's just nice to have? Or because we've always done it that way? As Grace Hopper once said, the most damaging phrase in the language is, we've always done it that way. So being intentional what we ask and how we ask it values the user's time by not making them spend any more of it than necessary. So you and I, of course, can agree in this room, all of us together, that yes, this is a great thing and we should all be doing it, but uh, that doesn't make any difference if you don't have any support for it. I get that. So I want to spend the last few minutes here talking about how to make that case to bosses, clients, coworkers, whoever it is that you need to, to, to talk to. So if you have to convince the programmers uh, or engineering types, you could do a lot worse than go back to Postel's Law, the robustness principle uh, that Jeremy talked about this morning, the whole thing about be conservative in what you send and liberal in what you accept. Uh, using the question protocol is a great way of being conservative in what you send, basically being conservative in what you ask, the questions that you send out to your users. Um, and being liberal in what you accept is, uh, you know, letting them do their own thing. Uh, Facebook letting you, you know, type in whatever uh, gender, political, or religious uh, affiliation the, that they want to. Um, or for that matter, and this is a classic one, you, you know the bit where they ask, or the site asks for a phone number and you type in a phone number and then it gives you an error message because you didn't format it in exactly the right way, right? It drives me crazy. It's like, text filtering's a thing. We've had it for a while. You could figure this out, right? That's, be, be liberal in what you accept. It's like they gave you a phone number, like count the number of digits and, and, and leave it there or, you know, sh like reformat it on the fly and sh so that they can look at it and say, oh, wait, no, that's not right. Whatever it is, right? But don't do the, I just filled out 17 pages and then I got to the end and it like loops all the way to the server and back and then it's like, you did not put dashes instead of periods in your phone number, right? Be liberal in what you accept. It's more likely, of course, you'll have to make a business case. So accessibility consultant Carl Groves, shown here representing, argues there are really only three viable business cases to do anything. These are them. So I want to cover each of those in turn. When it comes to making money, a good way to make money is to stand out um, as something special or different. You know, Slack has what now, $3 billion valuation or something like that on what's essentially IRC on steroids. Slack, I mean, Slack literally understands IRC commands. If you've, if you've ever used IRC in like the slash me and then something, Slack processes those. It'll do something with those. Anyway. And they just, uh, fairly recently, I think, didn't they just add a pared down version of Skype, right? But they have a $3 billion valuation in a crowded field, right? There are a lot of chat and communication tools out there, but they're really a standout. And, and part of that is they make it really simple to get help, uh, uh, get support, to report an issue. And part of it is that internally, everyone who works at Slack takes a turn on the customer support channels. Right? It's, not, it's not shoved away into a corner. So everyone gets a look at what is frustrating the people who are using the product. Um, you know, and so they've made it easy to customize settings and customize the skin color of your emoji to more accurately reflect you yourself, right? All those sorts of things. At every turn, this is what they focus on. And um, Stuart Butterfield, the founder, has articulated this in interviews, right? This is, he's talking about empathy. Right? But this is really compassion. Right? It's built directly into the company culture. And it, it just manifests itself all the way through what Slack does, and it's made them one of the hottest fields, hottest companies in a really crowded field. On the flip side, if a pro site or process is leading to a lot of frustration, then the chances are it's costing money. Uh, that was the case with the government digital service, the folks behind gov.uk. Uh, according to its own research, 
in uh, 2011, the UK government was receiving about 150 million avoidable phone calls per year. That is to say, phone calls about products or services that were already very well represented online or in other uh, areas, right? Some, something existed for people, but they were phoning in anyway. So across the board, non-digital transactions were costing the UK government about four billion pounds per year. The latest estimate that I've seen uh, from, I believe, the beginning of this year is that um, as they've created digital tools that are you know, more built around what users actually want, um, something Jerry will be talking about in just a little bit, uh, they've estimated annual savings between 1.7 to 1.8 billion pounds per year. They cut, basically, the UK government cut its customer support costs in half. And then there's risk reduction. So there are a lot of kinds of risk in this business, in any business, one of which is the ever popular spending more money than you are making, right? Which reducing your costs can really help with that. Um, making money can also help with that, but there are other risks as well. For one, it is a viral media landscape these days, and you never know when the unfortunately designed interaction that you create will end up being a global news story. That actually happened to Facebook with Year in Review. Uh, it ended up on places like CNN, the Washington Post, uh, Le Monde, uh, Independent UK. Jeremy actually saw it in print um, and, and uh, put a picture up, that sort of thing, right? Now, admittedly, the, the risk of that is somewhat minimal. It can happen, don't get me wrong, but it is minimal. The far more uh, immediate risk is in losing the trust of your users or never having a chance to gain the trust of people who might have wanted to use your product, but they effectively feel turned away or shut out from the moment that they try to use something. I mean, it's really hard to go wrong by being respectful of people. It's a lot easier to go wrong with making assumptions, uh, particularly assumptions you didn't consciously make. So there are a lot of ways to make this case directly. Uh, one of them, we, Sarah and I cover several in the book, uh, but one of them is to, is to uh, do what's called um, making a spectacle of your evidence. Doesn't necessarily mean laser shows, although, you know, you do you. But um, it does mean going outside the norms. So in the book, uh, Sarah and I uh, have a, a case where we talk to a content strategist who knew that they had the forms that they were working on had to be redesigned. They were causing all kinds of user frustration. So. They, the problem was they needed to get the stakeholders to also accept that. So what they did was they took video of users using this form, right? In one case, they had a user who struggled for half an hour to finish a single page of this process. And then they showed those videos to the stakeholders. When they presented these clips to the stakeholders, everyone just basically went still. And as she said, it had never occurred to them that the experience could be unkind. And just seeing that, that, that direct human connection of seeing somebody using the product and getting frustrated with it and struggling with it for so long cemented the stakeholders' commitment to fixing the problem. Right there in that meeting. It was done by the end of the day. Right? So that's an example of spectacle. The stakeholders probably expected written reports and graphs and you know, pie charts and all that sort of thing. That's what they're used to. And it, it's actually those sorts of things create kind of a distance. Um, but that video showing that, that, that human situation kicked the discussion into a whole new place. But the most effective thing we can do is just make a habit of this in our work as well as in our personal lives, but in our work, make a habit of being compassionate in what it is that we do. I mean, right, I know most of us don't have that power to, to change budgets, to realign priorities overnight, but by working on it, by working at this, by doing it where we can, when we can, we can start to, start to shift the culture. Sometimes the ship turns very slowly, I understand that, but sometimes you have to do that repeated work to make that ship turn. And a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these principles can be used in trying to figure out how it is to most effectively talk to those stakeholders, right? Because if you start to see the whole situation through their eyes, then you can much better, just as you would with your users, understand how to address their concerns. 
So Karen McGrain, uh, a few years ago now, uh, said this in a talk, right? Which really, I mean, it, Karen, of course, summed up everything I'm trying to say, right? This is about something deeper than empathy. It's compassion, right? Having that, as she says, that genuine, um, genuine emotional feeling. This is about seeing the people who use our work as more than users, as more than behavioral puzzles to be solved, but seeing them as actual complete humans with complicated and often messy lives that could probably use, as, as we all could, a, a touch more kindness and compassion, right? Our industry talks a lot about empathy as a way of understanding users, but this is something a little deeper. It's not just being nice, it's accepting people as they come and all their faults and actually doing something with it. And compassion can be a tricky thing to get right and sometimes we are gonna miss the mark no matter how hard we try. That is also human, right? The next step is to learn from those mistakes and share what we've learned with each other. What we've gotten wrong, for that matter, what we've gotten right. And if you have a record with your users of being compassionate, at the times when you stumble, they will be much more likely to forgive you and keep going rather than walk away in disgust because you have lost all of their trust. You build up that, that trust capital and then you have a little to spend. That makes us, as Jeremy said this morning, good ancestors to each other, to our craft, as well as just plain good people. It's vital that we do this individually and as a field because right now we're moving through an emotional uncanny valley where all the things we're doing are much closer to each other personally than they've ever been before. Right? As more and more people come online and more and more of our lives become represented digitally, that need to show kindness and understanding and respect and compassion is only going to increase. The web is the most human artifact, I believe, that has ever been created and so my challenge to you today is to use your skills and your compassion to make it more humane. Thank you.